catching the bad guys, defending the good guys, saving the endangered, Global Environmental Crime Watch. I'm your host, Bill Paul. Stay tuned for a remarkable tale of two women, one a sinner, the other a saint. We're also going to take you back to that terrible tsunami in Japan and the nuclear catastrophe that followed and tell you why a horrible environmental crime may have been committed. We'll also tell you what connects a convict in South Africa with a castle in England and an antiques dealer in New York City. Here's a hint. On the lighter side, we'll tell you about the Chewing Gum Action Group. Real name, real campaign to stop people from spitting out their gum on the pavement. But we begin with new environmental crime statistics that are going to make you sick. Put together by the London-based environmental human rights group Global Witness, this chart shows that nearly twice as many environmental activists were killed in 2011 than in 2009, and that approximately two activists are now being killed every week. To find out why, let's go to London and talk to the report's co-author, Global Witness's Billy Kite. Billy, how are you? And thank you for joining us. Hi, Bill. Thanks for having me. Well, yes, it's an issue of massive importance at the moment. We've been tracking these, this data for the last few months, and we found out that over the last 10 years, there's been a huge spike in the amount of killings of environmental activists, defending their rights to lands and forests. It's something that we, we perceive as a trend in terms of the global competition for resources. The land and forests are deteriorating, the amount of size, investments are coming in, and activists are, are being killed for their work defending these rights. Okay, so who's doing the killing? Well, we have found various actors involved. Uh, the private sector, so companies themselves, agribusiness, hydropower, defending some of their assets against these, these communities and activists, but also state security forces who are either drafted in to protect some of these investments by the companies, or themselves uh, acting with uh, deliberate use of force in protests. And, um, and where in the world is this problem uh, most prevalent, most extreme? Well, from the survey we've done, we found that Latin America is the epicenter of this uh, crisis. That, this may well be because social movements there are stronger. There's better monitoring and reporting of some of these deaths, but also because we have vast patterns of unequal land ownership in uh, Latin America. And okay. also large numbers of people who are disenfranchised and poor who are fighting for their rights for lands and forests. Am I correct that Brazil is, is something of the epicenter of this problem? That's correct. Brazil accounts for more than half of the killings we found over the last 10 years, over 300. Good heavens. This is, I, I mean, dis why? Describe the, the sort of thing that, that causes an environmental activist, particularly in Brazil, to lose his or her life. Sure. So in Brazil, there's... Vast quantities of people who are without land, who are fighting for their rights, they have a strong awareness of their rights behind them, and they compete against uh, a vested elite of corporate um, multinational companies who come in and take away some of their land and their rights to their forests. Do they actually try to fight back, or are they just picked off in the middle of the night? What happens? Well, the reporting is mainly done by the Catholic Land Commission, who are an NGO who have a good monitoring organization behind how many deaths happen in Brazil. And they found that many of it is conflict between uh, landowners and local indigenous groups or local groups who have been evicted from their lands or are fighting for the legal recognition of their lands. So again, it's, it's poor people against uh, vested elites, corporate elites. Now, you were recently in Brazil to release this report as part of a UN and a global environmental conference. Am I right? That's right, Bill. Okay. Yeah. And am I also right that while this conference was going on, just about 20, 30 miles away, a couple of environmental activists, fishermen, I believe, were, were killed literally during the con conference? 
That is true, Bill, and that's symptomatic of the, of the crisis that we're facing at the moment. Governments need to act. They need to bring the perpetrators to justice. They also need to ensure that natural resources are managed sustainably because this competition for land and forests is becoming increasingly more violent. For the first time, we're seeing that the environment is a key battleground for human rights. And it's never been more important to campaign for the environment and never been more deadly. What can people do to make a difference in protecting these environmental activists? People can call and pressurize their governments to act. Through our research, we found that there's no international body or government actually monitoring this situation. So we're seeing no compilation of these figures. As far as we know, this is the first time any NGO or government agency has actually com compiled the figures on activists who've been killed over, over the last decade. Talk about someone who has been killed, uh, whose situation really epitomizes the, the risks that environmental activists are taking today. So one emblematic case would be of uh, Chut Vutsi. He's a prominent environmentalist. He was a prominent environmentalist in Cambodia. He fought against illegal logging and corruption in the forest sector in Cambodia. He started his own uh, NGO called the Natural Resource Protection Group. He also worked for us, Global Witness, a campaign group in, in 2000. Um, his uh, investigations into the links between politicians, the military, corporate elites, and illegal logging, literally ripping out from the earth these high-value trees in Cambodia and wrecking the natural heritage of this country has led to, for him to have threats and intimidation. So this year in April, he was stopped at a military checkpoint whilst investigating illegal logging in the southeast of the country. And he was with two journalists who reported hit the fact that he wouldn't give to them, the military police that is, um, the photographic evidence he had of illegal logging in that area. Mm. So the military police shot him dead, killed him on the spot. I got to tell you, sir, you don't paint a pretty picture and you don't paint a very optimistic picture. Unfortunately, it's probably a very real picture, however. Yeah. All right, Billy Kite, we very much appreciate you taking the time, speaking to us from London. Good luck and good luck to Global Witness. Great. Thanks, Bill. Take care. Take care. On or about the 9th of September, 2012, only six months after the death of Chut Vuti, a Cambodian journalist who wrote extensively about illegal logging was found beaten to death with what police said was probably an axe. Hang Serai Audem, the reporter for the Varakchant Ned Daily, was murdered a week after he wrote that a military police officer had taken a cargo of illegal timber for himself. The officer, and his wife, were taken into custody after a search of their house turned up incriminating evidence. You can follow this and other stories on our website, Global Environmental Crime Watch. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. We'll be right back to answer the question, has there been an environmental crime committed in Japan? And we'll tell you about a really strange group. Its name is the Chewing Gum Action Group. That's coming up. Welcome back to Global Environmental Crime Watch. I'm your host, Bill Paul. Was a terrible environmental crime committed in Japan? The government there thinks so, and they blame the executives of Tokyo Electric Power for being guilty of criminal negligence. Now it looks like those guys could go on trial and, if convicted, do hard labor. To find out what the heck is going on here, let us go now to Greenwich, Connecticut to speak with an electric utility and nuclear power expert, Daniel Scotto. Dan, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Bill. Okay, Dan, you're the, you're the expert. You have the inside feel for what exactly happened at Fukushima and where these executives did not fulfill their obligations. Please explain all that. Well, it appears uh, based on a recent study um, that the management has been deemed to be negligent uh, in many of its activities, um, as well as having a past of covering up certain irregularities at that facility and other facilities. When you say cover up, I mean, what exactly did they do? Um, actually, not follow established um, nuclear agency regulatory protocols, as well as cover up certain areas of mismanagement, 
not invest in certain backup um, generators, things of that nature. Okay, now this is obviously a tough question to answer, but if they had done their job properly, what wouldn't have happened? How much better might this, this terrible situation have been? Well, as I said before, there was recently a major study um, conducted by a Japanese university suggesting that had the proper measures been taken, particularly with regard to backup generators, that uh, the, could, the plant could have withstood um, both the earthquake and the ensuing tsunami. Whoa. So what you're telling me is there would not have been a, nu a, a Fukushima nuclear disaster? Uh, that's what all the studies seem to suggest. So in terms of this being an environmental crime, how unique is this? Now, we certainly don't have any precedents here in the United States uh, for this. Um, and it seems to be something which is endemic to the culture in Japan. So that did, obviously does not seem to be something unusual there. Uh, the burden of proof, obviously, is on the government. Um, interestingly enough, uh, seven members of the government are actually included um, in that lawsuit uh, for criminal actions, uh, members of the Nuclear Safety Administration as well as the government. It uh, sets a precedent which arguably um, could extend to the United States as well. In your opinion, will charges be brought? Yes. Um, I think it's pretty evident that charges will be brought um, against the management and, and members of, of the regulatory bodies. In your opinion, will there be a trial? Uh, there probably will be a trial. Now, whether or not they'll be convic convicted is, is a much different question. Okay. Uh, the burden of proof is, is very difficult um, in Tokyo insofar as these issues of corporate negligence are concerned. But I, I do think there will be a trial, and if there's a conviction, uh, ironically enough, um, they could be sentenced to prison, and that prison would be hard time. Uh, literally, they would be forced into manual labor. Has the full extent of the, the environmental damage occurred already, or is this like a, a slow-moving nightmare where we may not know the full extent of the contamination uh, for many years, if not decades? For the time being, I think that uh, we, we probably have uh, discovered the full extent of the damage. Uh, as we all know, with radiation, uh, there are, there are long-term effects, and I guess we really won't know about additional uh, effects uh, until the passage of time. But for now, I mean, the consequences seem pretty severe as, as they now stand, and um, we'll just have to wait and see what the future brings. Just out of curiosity. What other types of corporate environmental crimes uh, can you think of? I mean, we've got one here that, that's, that's pretty clear. If these guys, in fact, did it, they, they, re, they, they were part of the reason why there was a release of ra radiation. Uh, would you put anything else in that, that big-time danger category? Um, it's very hard to find an exact example um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, the BP oil spill, um, the, the event in India uh, many years ago, um, Chernobyl, um, and, of course, our own Three Mile Island nuclear accident in 1979. But um, nothing seems to be as severe um, as this particular incident. On September 14, 2012, the Japanese government said it intends to phase out nuclear power by the end of the 2030s. Critics immediately blasted the plan, contending it was full of loopholes. You can follow this story and more on our website, globalenvironmentalcrimewatch.tv. We'll be right back with a story about something worth more than gold and about that strange group of bubblegum stoppers. Welcome back to Global Environmental Crime Watch. I'm your host, Bill Paul. Jerks like this guy have slaughtered more than 300 rhinos so far this year, just in South Africa. There's a part of the rhino that is so valuable, 
thieves recently stole one from Norwich Castle in England. And an antiques dealer in New York was convicted for illegally trying to sell the one in this picture. Rhino horns are used for carvings that in some cultures are considered lucky charms. They have gotten so valuable today that pound for pound, rhino horns are now worth their weight in gold. In India too, rhino poaching is out of control. In the first nine months of 2012, 11 one horn rhinos were killed and their horns removed by poachers in Kazlaranga National Park in the state of Assam. You can follow this story and more on our website, globalenvironmentalcrimewatch.tv. We'll be right back to tell you about a tale of two women, one a saint, the other a sinner. Welcome back to Global Environmental Crime Watch. I am your host, Bill Paul. Environmental crime is no laughing matter, but hey, it does have its lighter side. In England, there is a group called, believe it or not, the Chewing Gum Action Group. The goal of this group is to get people to stop spitting their gum out on the pavement. How? By getting towns to find the spitters on the spot. Their posters can be cheery, and they can be threatening. Bottom line, however, you spit, you pay. We will be right back with that tale of two women, one a sinner, the other a saint. Welcome back to Global Environmental Crime Watch. I'm your host, Bill Paul. Next, a tale of two women. One a sinner, one definitely a saint. Albania de Leon was the first woman on the United States Environmental Protection Agency's most wanted list. She was arrested in 2008 for falsely certifying that 28 individuals had taken her course in asbestos abatement. After she was convicted, she flew the coup, but eventually she was rearrested and now she's behind bars. Now meet our saint, Stephanie Vernio. The picture here is from the website of Stephanie's nonprofit, SOS Elephants. Stephanie lives in the African country of Chad where she fights a lonely battle against poachers. But this French lawyer will not give up. Her latest project is an orphanage for baby elephants that have lost their mothers. You can follow this and other stories on our website, Global Environmental Crime Watch. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. That's it for this edition of Global Environmental Crime Watch. Join us again next time. I'm your host, Bill Paul. <laughs>